Hello and good evening everyone and welcome back to another chapter of Beelzebub's Tales and actually the final chapter in book one. So this evening we'll see the end of book one and there's two further books to read and chapter 28 is called The Chief Culprit in the Destruction of All the Very Saintly Labours of Ashata Shemash. And if you've been with us and you're fully caught up, you will know that the last four chapters, five chapters, uh, no, the last three chapters, forgive me, uh, have been all about the very saintly Asiata Shemash and how he's established these moral principles and frameworks for humanity doing his part as a, an incarnation a prophet, and then chapter 28, uh, we have a character, Lentro, Lentro Hamsanin, who undoes everything and is the chief culprit in the destruction of all the very saintly labours of Aisha Tashimash. And again, a very interesting chapter. I've been studying it before now, so I can give you a brief overview before we begin. But before I get into a preview of what's to come. Let me just say hello to everyone. Hello there, Google. Google says, hi, folks. Looking forward to this one. Uh, Kathy says, yay. Some good reading tonight and a bit earlier for you, Kathy. So I hope uh, you're doing well and you've had a nice Monday at work. Uh, Rich says, or R maybe. Rich. R. Rich says, hello, everyone. Graham's here so we can begin. Graham says, hello, all. Would be nice, uh, says hello. And Voldemar's here and says hi. Another Polish found Gurdjieff. Uh, history repeats itself. And Kathy says hello, clubbers. So hello, everyone. And it's good to be back. As much as I enjoy being away for the weekend, I do miss our live reads. So I'm, I'm actually glad to be back. And if you haven't seen it yet, I did a stream earlier today in which I shared uh, the Gurdjieff biography and memoirs of some of his followers so if you haven't seen that yet once we finish here you can go and check that out and decide which of those wonderful memoir stroke biographies you'd like to encounter and uh, learn a bit more about who was Gurdjieff who was the man we know a lot about his ideas and his writings but who was he and it's an interesting exploration I'm not saying that I can tell you or that you can even discover it by reading one book but by reading many of the sources, you can begin to form a picture of who Gurdjieff was as a man. And hello there, Laurie. But just quickly, let me give you a brief um, preview of what we will encounter in chapter 28. The main culprit is this Lentro Hamsanin, and he has an invention, which I couldn't really decipher what it was maybe together we'll understand some sort of new government or new form of government I think but again we'll work it out together we talk about knowledge and being uh, Lentro Hamsonin and his writings which are a critique of contemporary life there's a very interesting section about the mutual inflation of the ideas by the power possessing the power possessing beings like the idea they raise it up by their power and influence and then everyone just because of that sort of becomes interested in the ideas so so very interesting uh as that relates to the the question of society um the civil war there's a civil war in the country and he explains what a civil war is and how that's different to normal war the normal reciprocal destruction War to spread ideas and state organisation, going from the question of the soul to the question of politics. Uh, Alexander the Great makes a clean sweep of Asia. And then a very interesting section towards the end, there is a section on the Has Hasnamus and a list of the Nalu Osnian spectrum of impulses and their characteristics. Then... Beelzebub tells us about the four different kinds of Hasnamuses and a very interesting section on the higher being bodies and reincarnation 
and they come about by conscious labours and intentional suffering. And the section towards the end, of course, I'll be sure to comment when we get there. But ultimately, Beelzebub is saying that if you don't create and crystallise these higher being bodies, then you have to reincarnate, you have to come back and try and coat them again, try and create them again. And it's there in, in you know, well, I was going to say plain English, but in in Beelzebub's English. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I think just as I was setting up the stream, I saw the eclipse, I believe. The eclipse is right now. So, <laughs> timely, timely. And so, um, yes. Hello there, Stephen, who says, Buena sera. Welcome, Stephen and everyone else. Yeah, wow. Fantastic. So, if you're enjoying and looking forward to the upcoming readings of Beelzebub's Tales, we'll read another chapter on Wednesday evening, and I'm going to do some more Gurdjieff content uh, this week. So, if you love all things Gurdjieff, and the fourth way, and the work, and the man himself, first, <laughs> like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then share the show on your social media with your friends. It's the best way and the easiest way to support Book Club by spreading the word and hopefully finding or hope that it finds the right people, the, the book lovers out there and more clubbers, potential clubbers. So, <clears throat> chapter 28. The chief culprit in the destruction of all the very saintly labours of Ashata Shemash. You remember that I have already told you that the basis of the initiative for the arising there of the factors which became the causes of the final destruction of the still surviving remains of the beneficent results of the conscious labours of the very saintly Ashata Shemash for the subsequent generations of your favourites did not issue from the learned beings who were then assembled from almost the whole of the surface of the earth in the city of Babylon, but that these latter, as it had long before become proper to most of the terrestrial learned beings of new formation, were only like contagious bacilli, the unconscious disseminators of every kind of then existing evil for their own and subsequent generations. And just a brief digression, believe it or not, that's one sentence. The whole first paragraph of the chapter is a sentence. So, People talk about the long sentences, and these first two paragraphs are, are whole sentences. So, <laughs> it's not the Bonton literary approach to writing, for sure. <clears throat> the basis for all the further great and small maleficent activities and unconscious maleficent manifestations of the learned beings of that time concerning the destruction of even the last remnants of the results beneficent for the three brain beings there, obtained from the very saintly conscious labours of the essence-loving Aishata Shemash, were, as my later detailed researches concerning these further very saintly activities made clear to me, the invention of a learned being well known there in his time, also belonging to the number of learned beings of new formation and named Lentro Hamsanin. As a result of his inner what is called double gravity-centred existence, the highest being part of the presence of this terrestrial three-brain being was coated and perfected up to the required gradation of objective reason, and later his highest being part became, as I have once already told you, one of those 313 highest being bodies who are called eternal Hasnamus individuals and who have the place of their further existence in the universe on a small planet already existing under the name of eternal retribution. Now, Strictly speaking about this terrestrial three-brain being, Lentro Hamsanin, I would have to fulfil my promise and to explain to you in detail about the expression Hasnamus, but I prefer to do so at a little later in the proper place of the sequence of this tale. Hi Ahmed, and welcome, and yeah, I hope, you're, I hope the reading helps. 
Laurie. The mentioned maleficent invention, or as they themselves, that is, the contemporary terrestrial learned beings, name such an invention of a learned being there of new formation, a composition, or even a creation, was actualized, as I have already told you, two or more centuries before the time when, during my fifth sojourn there, I first reached the city of Babylon, where partly by coercion and partly voluntarily, learned beings had been assembled from the surface of almost the whole of the planet. The maleficent composition of that learned being of former centuries reached the learned beings of the said Babylonian epoch by means of what is called a kashiretile, on which this invention was engrossed by the said learned Lentro Hamsanin himself. I find it necessary to inform you a little more in detail about the history of the arising of this Lentro Hamsanin, and also how, owing to which accidental circumstances of his environment, he later became there a great learned being and authority for his contemporary beings of almost the whole surface of your planet. In addition to this history itself being very characteristic, it can also serve as a good elucidatory example of that practice which has long ago become firmly established in the process of the existence of these three brain beings who have taken your fancy, the result of which is that several of them at first become, so to say, authorities for other learned beings of new formation, and thereby later for all the unfortunate ordinary beings there. The details concerning the conditions of the arising and subsequent formation of this Lentro Hamsanin into a responsible being chanced to become clear to me, by the way, during my investigations of which aspects of the strange psyche of your favourites were the basis for the gradual change and ultimately also for the total destruction of all those beneficent special forms and customs in the process of their being existence which had been introduced and firmly fixed in this process by the ideally foreseeing reason of our now omnicosmic, most very saintly Asiata Shemash during the period of his self-preparation to be that which he now is for the whole of the universe. <laughs> um, yes, that's right. Voldemort and I think that's what Gurdjieff was trying to do right little little short sentences are easy to grasp he wants us to concentrate to work hard for the meaning and maybe it's easier to do it through intuition rather than reason and maybe that's why we have to uh, read it three times and um hello there Bill Bill says hi everyone and hello Bill and welcome everyone It was then that I learned that this Lentro Hamsen in arose, or, as it is said there, was born, on the continent Asia, in the capital of Nievia, the town Krombukhorn. The conception of his arising resulted from the blending of two heterogeneous exioharis formed in two already elderly three-brain Keshapmatnian beings there. His producers, or, as it is said there, his parents, having chosen as the place for their permanent existence the capital Nievia, moved there three terrestrial years before the arising of that later universal Hasnamus. For his elderly and very rich parents, he was what is called a firstborn, for although the blending of their exioharis had been many times actualized between them before him, yet, as I found out, they, being deeply engaged in the business of acquiring riches and not wishing to have any hindrance for this, had recourse at each actualizing of this sacred blending to what is called tusi, or, as your contemporary favorites express themselves, abortion. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Google, Google, he does. At the very beginning, he says, uh, and just a quick, a quick uh, digression for, um, yeah, I won't read it now, but yes, if you find the book, there's, um, Ten books in three series, and it says what the series are, the first series, the second series, and the third series. And then there's some friendly advice 
about how to read it and what to do. So, uh, yes, there is uh, Google, Google, and I would advise you pick up a copy of Beelzebub's Tales and, yeah, read that bit. Or I'm sure in the introduction or in the arousing of thought, I would probably read that passage. So go back and uh, check out the earlier videos in the beginning of the playlist. Towards the end of his activities in acquiring riches, the source of the active principle of his origin, or as it is said there, his father, had several of his own what are called caravans, and he also owned special caravanserais for the exchange of goods in various cities of this same Nievia. And the source of the passive principle of his origin, that is, his mother, was at the f at, at first of the... Prof I'll try again, but it's very interesting what he calls um, mother and father, right? The, the male principle, the father, is the source of the active principle of his origin, and the mother, the female, the source of the passive principle of his arising. And hello there, Donna Harper, lovely to see you, welcome. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll read, well, I may as well say all that again, because... <clears throat> <clears throat> Towards the end of his activities in acquiring riches, the source of the active principle of his origin, or as it is said there, his father, had several of his own what are called caravans, and he also owned special caravanserais for the exchange of goods in various cities of this same Nievia. And the source of the passive principle of his origin, that is, his mother, was at first of the profession of what is called Tusiji. But later, on a small mountain, she organized what is called a holy place and published broadcast, among other beings, information concerning its supposed special significance, namely, that beings of the female sex without children would, on visiting this place, acquire the possibility of having them. When this couple, in what is called the decline of their years, had already become very rich, they moved to the capital city, Krombokon, in order to exist there, but only for their own pleasure. But soon they felt that without a real result, or as they say there, in childlessness, there cannot be full pleasure, and from ta that time on, without sparing what is called money, they took every kind of measure to obtain such a result. With this end in view, they visited various holy places existing there for that purpose, of course with the exception of their own holy mountain, and resorted to every kind of what are called medical means, which purported to assist the blending of heterogeneous exioharis, and when eventually by chance such a blending was actualized, then there indeed arose, after a certain time, just that long-awaited result of theirs, later called Lentro Hamsanin. From the <laughs> from the very first day of his arising, the parents were, as it is said, completely wrapped up in what they described as their godsent result, or son, and they spent vast sums on his pleasures on what was called his education. To give their son the very best upbringing and education the earth could provide became for them, as it is said there, their ideal. With this aim they hired for him various what are called tutors and teachers, both from among those existing in the country Nievia and from various distant lands. These latter, that is, these foreign tutors and teachers, they then invited chiefly from the country which at the present time is called Egypt. Already by the time this terrestrial, what is called Papa's and Mama's darling, was approaching the age of a responsible being, he was, as it is said there, very well instructed and educated. That is, he had in his presence a great deal of data for all kinds of being ego plasticori, consisting, as it, is, as it is usual there, according to the abnormally established conditions of their existence, of various fantastic and dubious information, and later, when he became a responsible being, he manifested himself automatically through all kinds of corresponding accidental shocks. 
When this later great learned being there reached the age of a responsible being, and although he had indeed a great deal of information, or as it is called there, knowledge, nevertheless he had absolutely no being in regard to this information or knowledge which he had acquired. Well, when the said mamas and papas darling became a learned being there of new formation, then, because on the one hand there was no being whatsoever in his presence, and on the other hand because there had already by this time been thoroughly crystallised in him those consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, which exist there under the names of vanity, self-love, swagger and so forth, the ambition arose in him to become a famous learned being, not only among the beings of Nievia, but also over the whole of the surface of their planet. So with all his presence he dreamed and ruminated how he could attain this. For many days he then thought seriously, and finally he decided first of all to invent a theory upon a topic which nobody before him had ever touched upon, and secondly to inscribe this invention of his upon such a kashiritle as nobody had ever before inscribed or would ever be able to in the future either. And from that day he made preparations for the actualizing of that decision of his. With the help of his many slaves, he first prepared a kashiritli, such as had never before existed. At that period of the flow of time on the planet Earth, the kashiritlis were generally made from one or another part of the hide of a quadruped being called their buffalo. But Lentro Hamsonin made his kashiritli from a hundred buffalo hides joined together. These kashiritlis were replaced later there by what is called parchment. Well, when this unprecedented kashiritli was ready, the subsequently great Lentro Hamsonin inscribed upon it his invention concerning a topic which, indeed, it had occurred to nobody to discuss before, and for which, in truth, there was no reason why it should have been. Namely, in those wise acrings of his, he then criticised in every way the existing order of collective existence. Mm -mm. <laughs> <coughs> uh, evening, Jack Daniels. Welcome, my friend. Hello. And hello, everyone. Mm -mm. And Donna says, Mamas and Papas, California Dreaming. Is a great song, and he said all these words. Maybe Beelzebub is a fan too, maybe. Or maybe Mamas and Papas California Dreaming is an incarnation of Beelzebub. <laughs> Who knows? And um, it appears there that uh, the invention that we encountered before, the cause of the uh, destruction of Aisha Tashimash's labours, it appears that it would it's been summarized in that uh, that sentence namely in those wise acrings of his he then criticized in every way the existing order of collective existence so kashiritli is the the preced or or precedes the parchment and this when they would be writing on animal hides buffalo hides and he's normally someone would have a buffalo hide and they'd write their stuff on there but he's put a hundred buffalo hides together so there's a lot of criticism going on and uh, the existing order of collective existence and this is a theme that we've seen in several places before in the book at the very beginning the reason for Beelzebub's being in our solar system ors is because he criticized the you know the planetary existence and the the established order if you like and so he was banished uh, to ors and there's also the reason for Beelzebub's first sojourn to the planet earth was because one of his martian brethren um bet the king that let me take control for a while and I'll make it better and he ended up not making it better, making it worse. And so there's this theme of criticising the existing order. And uh, I don't know what you guys think about that, but I don't know. For me, it feels almost like a warning. Don't do that. Don't criticise the existing order because nothing can come of it. 
but rather work on yourself. Work on yourself. Uh, yeah, I don't think he was a Mason, Voldemar. I've never read that anywhere in my uh, reading. So, yeah, again, if they're saying that he was a Mason, I think that's inaccurate. And hello there, Leonardo Borges. Welcome, welcome. So I'll go back a uh, a paragraph so that we can get some flow going. Well, when this unprecedented Kashiritli was ready, the subsequently great Lentro Hamsanin inscribed upon it his invention concerning a topic which, indeed, it had occurred to nobody to discuss before, and for which, in truth, there was no reason why it should have been. Namely, in those wise acrings of his, he then criticised in every way the existing order of collective existence. This Kashiritli began thus. Man's greatest happiness consists in not being dependent on any other personality whatsoever and in being free from the influence of any other person, whoever he may be. Some other time I will explain to you how your favourites, the strange three brain beings there on the planet Earth, in general understand freedom. This subsequently universal Hasnamus inscribed further as follows. Undeniably, life under the present state organisation is now far better for us than it used to be before. But where then is that real freedom of ours upon which our happiness must depend? Don't we work and labour as much now as during all other former state organisations? Haven't we to labour and sweat to get the barley indispensable to us to live and not to starve to death like chain dogs? Our chiefs, guides and counsellors are always telling us about some other sort of world, supposedly so much better than here among us on the earth, and where life is in every respect beatific for the souls of those men who have lived worthily here on the earth. Don't we live here now, worthily? Don't we always labour and sweat for our daily bread? If all that our chiefs and counsellors tell us is true and their own way of living here on the earth really corresponds to what is required of their souls for the other world, then of course God ought, and even must, in this world also give more possibilities to them than to us ordinary mortals. If all that our chiefs and counsellors tell and try to make us believe is really true, let them prove it to us, ordinary mortals, by facts. Let them prove it to us, for instance, that they can at least change a pinch of the common sand in which, thanks to our sweat, our daily bread arises, into bread. If our present chiefs and counsellors do this, then I myself will be the first to run and kneel and kiss their feet. But meanwhile, as this is not so, we ourselves must struggle and we ourselves must strive hard for our real happiness and for our real freedom, and also to free ourselves from the need of having to sweat. It is true that for eight months of the year we now have no trouble in obtaining our daily bread, but then how we must labour those four summer months and exhaust ourselves getting the barley we need. Only he who sows and mows that barley knows the hard labour required. True, for eight months we are free, but only from physical labours, and for this our consciousness, namely our dearest and highest part, must remain day and night in slavery to these illusory ideas which are always being dinned into us by our chiefs and counsellors. No, enough. We ourselves, without our present chiefs and counsellors, who have become such without our onset, must strive for our real freedom and our real happiness." And we can only obtain real freedom and real happiness if we all act as one, that is to say, all for one and one for all. But for this we must first destroy all that is old. And we must do so to make room for the new life we shall ourselves create that will give us real freedom and real happiness. Down with dependence on others. We ourselves will be masters of our own circumstances and no longer they who rule our lives and do so without our knowledge and without our consent. Our lives must be governed and guided by those whom we ourselves shall elect from our midst, that is, by men only from amongst those who themselves struggle for our daily barley. And we must elect these governors and counsellors on the basis of equal rights, without distinction of sex or age, by universal, direct, equal and open ballot. Thus ended the said famous Kashiritli. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, well said there, Donna. And it's funny, like I've shared, I did a stream earlier talking about the Who is Gurdjieff, the memoirs and biography. And so, so yes, you should um, go and watch that and read all those books and get a very well rounded picture of who Gurdjieff was. And Google Guru says he seems to have something of an impatience with purely intellectual more logical discourse and yeah I think that's fair he would often mock Ospensky in In Search of the Miraculous particularly uh, and say to Ospensky very clearly you know if you understood everything that you wrote in your books then you'd be teaching me and so yeah I think there's no more of a um, a clear sign of what you're saying there Google Google than that that he would mock Ospensky and, and say those things to him. And yeah, anyone who sort of asked a, a, a very intellectual question or trying to be clever, he would sort of give them a shock and wake them up and make them realise um, that they're being silly. And also, Ospensky would often ask these intellectual questions and Gurdjieff would, I suppose the word maybe would be meta or he sort of go some levels down. He's saying, you don't understand the word. You don't understand what you're asking me. I'm going to have to expand on what you're saying. And there's levels. So... <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that, Kathy. That's what we want. We want, we want the intrigue. Kathy says, people like to put labels on Gurdjieff because it's very easy to do concerning his personality and knowledge from womanizer to black black magic magician that just intrigues me even more and that's that's what we want and again as i argued in the stream earlier if all you've done is heard someone say you know gurdjieff was a freemason or gurdjieff was a black magician or gurdjieff was a womanizer and you just heard it second hand or in some youtube video just forget that you know forget that there's books written as i'm sh as i shared earlier in the stream the, the previous stream of the day and you got to you got to read those accounts you got to read those accounts and have a well rounded opinion of the man and if you haven't read any of those biographies and memoirs then well what's your opinion based on if it's based on someone else's opinion from a youtube video well I mean, with all respect, it's not a very good opinion. <clears throat> when this subsequent universal Hasnamus Lentro Hansenin had finished inscribing his Kashiritli, indeed unprecedented there, he arranged an enormous and costly banquet to which he invited all the learned beings from Nievia taking upon himself all their travelling expenses, and at the end of this banquet he showed them his kashiritli. And this is the section where Beelzebub saying, the power possessing ones, read the kashiritli, <laughs> I suppose it could be a text or whatever, and because they're the power possessing and they say this is good, we endorse this if you like, then everyone's like, oh yeah, this must be the truth then, and then it starts spreading all over the world, but we'll get to that. When the learned beings then gathered at the free feast from almost the whole of Nievia saw that indeed unprecedented Kashiritli, they were, f they were at first so astounded that they became, as it is said there, as if petrified, and only after a considerable time did they gradually begin looking at each other with dumbfounded glances and exchanging opinions in whispers. Chiefly, they asked one another how it was possible that not a single learned being nor a single ordinary being had known or guessed that there in their own country such a learned being with such knowledge existed. 
Suddenly, one of them, namely the oldest among them, who enjoyed the greatest reputation, jumped up on the table like a boy, and in a loud voice and with the intonation which had already long before become proper to the learned beings there of new formation, and which has also reached the contemporary learned beings, uttered the following, "'Listen, all of you be aware that,' We, the representatives of terrestrial beings assembled here, who have thanks to our great learning already attained independent individuality, have the happiness to be the first to behold with our own eyes the creation of a Messiah of divine consciousness sent from above to reveal world truths to us. Thereupon that, that usual... Oh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good points there. Graham says the intellect is only one brain. There are two others. So there's the we as if you've been listening to Beelzebub, we're three brain beings or three centered beings: the intellectual center, the emotional center, and the moving center. There's also other centers, but I won't go into it. And Donna says, funny how people when doing this work should see how imperfect we are through self-observation yes donna yet they appear to expect others such as g to be perfect especially to their own view of perfection and that's well said and voldemar says and some probably say rubbish because of jealousy how come some guy was more spiritual than nowadays fake couch and yoga gurus I sense his teachings as I fa as the truth I finally find the path. Yeah, and I'm, obviously I would agree with that. But, yeah, every, everyone's do, doing their own thing, aren't they? I, I think it's great that we have this community where we, we share um, the gurge of ideas and our own observations and journey. Um, but no one should set anyone else up as a, as a guru, right? Gurge if left the tales for us to his grandchildren i believe that ospensky's in search of the miraculous is the best best and most concise exposition of the ideas and then you read whatever else you want you know i shared earlier as i'm saying <laughs> anyone who think i want you to go and watch that video but there are many biographies and memoirs also that are less dense with technical terminology and more just like a biography, like, oh, yeah, I, I lived at the Priory and Gurdjieff was there and this happened and that happened. And there's no octaves and there's no enneagrams and all these things. It's just a nice little biography. So. <clears throat> and thanks to Graham again once more for referencing often Fritz Peters's writings, because I've now finished Boyhood with Gurdjieff and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it was nice to get back to the Gurdjieff biographies, which is what caused me to um, make that video. So thanks our own G. Um, and Kathy says, there are many gurus and yogis that have people accusing them of womanizing and being charlatans. Osho, Sadhguru and more all have accusations against them. And it's, it's the nature, isn't it? It's the nature of power. It happens in all the cults. Uh, Jonestown, Waco, or all of them is what is what happens. Is yeah, I'm not going to digress into that. But if you look at a band of uh, apes, right? If you watch Chimp Empire, I think in uh, on Netflix, there's a great documentary. We're we're mammals. We're uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, isn't it? If you look at a load of apes and monkeys. And watch how they behave, isn't it? There's an alpha male and then everyone else is subservient to the alpha. And over time, the alpha gets old. The young upcomings come up and it's an ongoing battle. So in these cult environments, no one's arguing that Gurdjieff wasn't the alpha male in the thing. He's, he's the guru. He's the man, isn't it? But yeah. It's good to question and inquire and ask your own question, which, which Fritz Peters does very nicely. You know, he's not all in. He's not, he's only a little boy in Boyhood with Gurdjieff. So he's, he doesn't sort of worship Gurdjieff, but he does see that people around him do. Um, people do worship Gurdjieff. And 
the more senior pupils, in a sense, they worship him the most. Again, you must read the book. Kathy says, just like burning witches way back when, because women collected herbs to heal ailments, that's correct, and also they had the knowledge, they had the knowledge to connect with God and what was what's a church going to do with a load of women who've got the knowledge and the sacrament to for direct connection to god we can't ha we can't have that i'm afraid and um rich says anyone still unsure of self observation might want to check out the mystic path to cosmic power by vernon howard really great practical explanation <laughs> <laughs> Graham's back. Graham back says, "Womanizer and black magician." For a minute, I thought you meant me. <laughs> so uh, maybe she did, Graham. Maybe it's a, a subtle tongue in cheek. But anyway, I'm I'm going to read on because this is a a very interesting bit about, in a sense, what happens with ideas now. You get if you get someone with loads of followers to endorse it then all their followers see it and it becomes popular. So I'm going to start that bit again and try not to interrupt my own self. <laughs> when this subsequent universal Hasnamus, Lentro Hamsonin, had finished inscribing this Kashiritli, indeed, I'm... Pre no, I should, I should read it, although should I? He's just... Um, no, I'm not going to read all that again, sorry. Sorry, guys, I'm distracting my own self, but the man's just jumped up on the table. An old man, the oldest among them of the greatest reputation, jumped on the table like a child and made this speech. Thereupon began that unusual, maleficent, what is called mutual inflation, which had already long been practised among the learned beings of new formation, and chiefly on account of which no true knowledge which has chanced to reach them ever evolves there, as it does everywhere else in the universe, even merely from the passage of time itself. But, on the contrary, even the knowledge once already attained there is destroyed, and its possessors always become shallower and shallower. And the rest of the learned beings then began shouting and pushing each other in order to get near Lentro Hamsanin, and addressing him as their long-awaited Messiah, they conveyed to him by their admiring glances what is called their high titillation. The most interesting thing about it all is that the reason why all the other learned beings were so greatly amazed and so freely gave vent to what are called their learned snivelings lay in a certain extremely strange conviction which had been formed in the psyche of your favourites thanks as always to the same abnormally established conditions of ordinary existence that if anybody becomes a follower of an already well-known and important being he thereby seems to be to all other beings almost as well known and important himself. So it was on the strength of his being very rich and, what is more important, already very famous, that all the other learned beings of that time in the country of Neavia immediately manifested themselves approvingly towards this Lentro Hamsanin. Well then, my dear boy, when, after the said banquet, the learned beings of Neavia returned home, they immediately began firstly to speak among their neighbours, and later more and more widely, here, there, and everywhere, about that unprecedented Kashitli itself, and, secondly, already foaming at the mouth, to persuade and convince everybody of the truth of those revelations which the great Lentro Hamsanin had inscribed on this Kashitli. The result of it all was that the ordinary beings of the town Krombokon, as well as of other parts of the country Nievia, talked among themselves of nothing but these revelations. And gradually, as it also happens there, almost everywhere beings became divided into two mutually opposing parties, one of which favoured the invention of the subsequent universal Hasnamus, and the other the already existing and well-fixed forms of being existence. <clears throat> oh, hello there, Sam. Welcome to the stream. How are you? And... Uh... <clears throat> <laughs> K 
Kathy says, indeed, Graham, you're right up there with the best of them. That small town you live in could pose a problem for you. <laughs> and uh, Donna says, now we know why you have lots of candles, Graham. <laughs> and so this part as well will refer to the mammalian impulse of I can't recall what it's called maybe Dunbar's number I think it is Dunbar's number but he's saying there right as gradually and gradually it also happens there almost everywhere beings became divided into two mutually opposing parties one of which favoured the invention the criticism of um, culture of the subsequent universal hasnamas and the other, the already existing and well-fixed forms of being existence. And this is what happens when uh, a troop of monkeys, I think that's the correct term, or apes, when they get to a certain size, they, they dissect, they bifurcate into two tribes and then so on and so on and so forth. And that's what happens. And now we're going to come to the bit where they talk about the civil war where one group of individuals so want to impress the other group of individuals with their ideas. They want them to adopt their ideas fully and they're not going to be happy and they're not going to sleep soundly until they do. And this is the division. I'm not going to sort of go into a diatribe on, on what's going on. But I mean, I'm sure everyone can look around the world, right, and see how divided everyone is. This uh, maybe it's Lentro Hansen him coming back from the dead and how everyone is so divided. What about what we agree on, you know? Maybe let's start there. But <clears throat> thus it continued during almost a whole terrestrial year, during which time the ranks of the contending parties increased everywhere, and towards each other there grew one of their particular properties called hate. The result of which was that one sorrowful day in the town of Krombukon itself, there suddenly began among the beings who had become followers of one or other of the two said mutually opposite currents, their process of what is called civil war. Civil war is the same as war. The difference is only that in ordinary war, beings of one community destroy the beings of another community, while in a civil war, the process of reciprocal destruction proceeds among beings of one and the same community, as, for example, brother annihilates brother, father, son, uncle, nephew, and so on. At the outset, during the four days that the horrible process was at its height in Krombukon, and the attention of the other beings of the whole country of Nievia was concentrated on it, everything was still relatively quiet in the other towns, but here and there small what are called skirmishes occasionally took place. When at the end of the fourth day those who were for the invention of Lentro Hansenim, that is, for the learned beings, were victorious in Krombukon, then from that time on the same process also at all the large and small points of the whole surface of Nievia. That widespread, terrifying process continued until there appeared hordes of learned beings who, as it is said, feeling firm ground beneath their feet, compelled all the surviving beings to accept the ideas of Lentro Hamsanin and immediately destroyed everything, and from then on all the three brain beings of Nievia became followers of the invention of Lentro Hamsanin, and soon after in that community there was established a special what is called Republic. A little later, the community Nievia, being at that period great and what is called powerful, began, as it also usually happens there, making war on the neighbouring communities for the purpose of imposing upon them also her new form of state organisation. <laughs> and we... Um, we're going to read, there's chapters coming up uh, entitled uh, America, Russia, Religion and Hypnotism. So there's many um, more interesting chapters to come. But that bit there, right? Uh, making war. I mean, if you just look at the American, um, there was a great uh, video of a man stating 
America's plan to, you know, bomb democracy into all these countries and we've got to give them their freedom, we've got to give them democracy. And this paragraph there is just saying exactly that. It's that exactly. And hello there, Sam, welcome. That, again, if you're American, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the, the, the government, the, the deep state, if you like. They go to war in order to, yeah, push their values, just what it's saying. I'm going to read it because, well, I've just read it, but I'll read it again because it really describes what's going on. A little later, the community Nievia, being at that period great and what is called powerful, began, as it is also usually happens there, making war on the neighbouring communities for the purpose of imposing upon them also her new form of state organisation. Pretty powerful little paragraph, but it's the truth, isn't it? If you see and look and observe the world, it's the truth, so... Kathy's speaking some truth. Let's see. Kathy says, I think one of the biggest drawbacks of today's society is that they put too much emphasis on appearances, even if it doesn't make them happy. House, car, job, spouse. And then before they know it, they end up sick. Uh, yes. What's the, the phrase, the colloquial phrase? Keeping up with the Joneses, I think. <laughs> um oh hello there karen karen's here and says hello fellow clubbers and welcome karen i hope you're doing well today um yes keeping up with the joneses as kathy's just said there in her comment but also the intense desire to make someone else believe what you believe and it's going on all the time why can't people just have a nice conversation and sort of agree to disagree, you know? Everyone wants to win. There's this thing on, uh, uh, well, it's not a thing, but you know it. It's, um, what's it? Dunked on. Ben Shapiro dunked on whatever. Or Jordan Peterson, you know, won against the whatever. Blah, blah, blah. You know, who cares about these? Maybe if you want to debate something that you feel strongly about but uh <laughs> yes kathy keeping up with the kardashians nowadays uh kathy says and and i think what with keeping up with the kardashians and the social media uh beauty filters it's a terrible thing for young girls and uh as long as i can i'll try and keep my daughter off of uh these it's an impossible like what Kathy's saying, uh, too much emphasis on appearance. And when you're sort of, what's the word? When you're, what the hell word am I looking for? When, when you're aspiring as a young girl to beauty that doesn't exist it's not real beauty the the women on instagram and facebook and tiktok and whatever it's not real because they're using a, a filter and so these young girls aspire to the beauty that's it's not real so how can you ever be as beautiful as something that's not even real anyway but yes good point kathy and hello there everyone um <clears throat> From that time on, my boy, on the largest continent of your planet, the processes of reciprocal destruction among these strange three-brain beings began to proceed as before, and at the same time they were gradually changed and finally destroyed those various beneficent forms of their ordinary existence which had already been fixed thanks to the ideally foreseeing reason of our now most very saintly Asiata Shemash. Thereupon there again began to be formed on the surface of your planet, only to be destroyed anew and to give place to others numerous separate distinct communities with every kind of form of inner state organisation. 
Although the direct effect of that maleficent invention of the now universal Hasnamus Lentro Hamsanin was that among your favourites the practice was revived of existing in separate distinct communities and they again resumed their periodic reciprocal destruction, yet within many of these newly arisen independent communities on the continent Asia, beings still continued to conform in their ordinary existence to many of the unprecedentedly wise wisely foreseen usages of the very saintly Asiata Shemash for their ordinary being existence, which usages had already been inseparably fused into their automatically flowing process of daily existence. And those to blame for the final destruction of these said usages and customs that still remained in certain communities were those learned beings who were then assembled in the city of Babylon. And they were then to blame in this respect, owing to the following. <laughs> and they were to blame in this respect, owing to the following. When, owing to that famous question of the beyond, they organised the general planetary conference of all the learned beings there, there happened to be also among the learned beings who went to Babylon on their own accord the great-grandson of Lentro Hansenim himself, who had also become a learned being. And he took with him there to the city of Babylon an exact copy of the mentioned Kashiritli, but made on papyrus, the original of which had been inscribed by his great-grandfather, and which he had obtained by inheritance, and at the very height of the frenzy concerning the question of the soul, during one of the last big general meetings of the learned beings, he read aloud the contents of that maleficent invention of his great-grandfather's, whereupon it occurred, as it had also become proper to the sorry learned beings of this planet, thanks to their strange reason that from one question which interested them, they at once passed to quite another, namely, from the question of the soul to the question of what is called politics. Thereupon, in the city of Babylon, meetings and discussions again began everywhere concerning the various kinds of already existing state organisations and those which, in their opinion, ought to be formed. As the basis of all their discussions, they took, of course, the truths indicated in the invention of Lentro Hamsanin, this time expounded on what is called a pup of a papyrus that had been taken there by his great-grandson, and a copy of which almost every learned being who was then in Babylon carried in his pocket. For several months they discussed and argued, and as a result, they this time split into parties, that is to say all the learned beings then in the city of Babylon split into two independent what are called sections, under the following names, the first, section of Neomothists, the second, section of Paleomothists. And I believe, I don't know what you guys think, but just... Um, uh, looking at it, no, actually, oh no, no, I, I was going to say uh, monotheist and polytheist, but it's not actually, looking at it now, neo-mothists and paleomothists, so the one sort of progressives and conservatives maybe, that um, as as we, we've learned that Lentro Hamsinin and his uh, <laughs> Kasheritli, one is criticising the old and wants to establish a new way for state organisation and the others argue against it and want to keep the same. So I suppose in um, modern parlance it would be liberals and conservatives or maybe progressives and conservatives the first, the section of Neomothists, and the second, section of Paleomothists. Neomothists would be the looking to the future, Paleomothists looking to the past, maybe. Again, I haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, but <laughs> I'll ha I have a good go. Um, Car <coughs> Excuse me. Karen says, Lewis, I assume as AI becomes more widely used, the unreal body perfection image will propagate more 
of the body dysphoria. And I think that's exactly right, uh, Karen. Uh, there's two films that I recommend everyone should watch if you're interested in uh, this this topic, AI, and how it's going to take over. Again, all very dystopian. Ex Machina, where we have a, uh, a, a robot that's artificially intelligent, you'd argue, and they bring a man to do the Turing test. And in the Turing test, you wouldn't know whether it's a machine or not. So you wouldn't know, is it a human, is it a machine? Whereas in this film, he says, I'm going to show you it's a machine, but I st and you're going to tell me if it's sentient. So that's the first film. And, uh, <laughs> and the other one is Her, Joaquin Phoenix. It's a wonderful film and I think it's quite old now. Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with what would be considered a very advanced Siri on his phone. So he gets his new phone and it's got Siri on and he falls in love with it. And it's like, what? You know? What do you mean? Why would I stop the live stream, Sam? You you can click off and go and watch something else, my friend. If you, I'm not, I'm not going to stop the live stream. We, we've still got some pages to read, Sam. So, um, yes. You'll have to... Um, Dogs are better, yeah, I, I agree, uh, Bill. Bill says dogs are better. And which one, Kathy, Ex Machina or um, Her? Both of them wonderful. But back to Karen's, um, Karen who's here just for the chat and not following the book. And that's perfectly fine, I would say. Um, but what I would argue is there's an app called ChatGPT, I, I sort of... Chat GPT is something that can be very helpful with productivity, but I was just having a conversation with my wife yesterday. I believe there's people in the world and maybe thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, yeah? And their most meaningful conversation would be with Chat GPT. And that's so sad. Oh, okay, uh, Karen. <laughs> and it's very sad, but again, it's still very nuanced, isn't it? Is it better to be lonely and have no one to talk to or to be able to talk to your large language model? I don't know. I have lots of people to talk to in the real world. Uh, and of course, I can talk to my heart's content here at the live stream, but it's, it's scary, it's fascinating, and it's a hell of a ride, isn't it? If you believe in, in reincarnation and like we learn in Beelzebub's Tales, one one incarnating um, for a purpose, the fact that we're all here together now at this time with nuclear weapons, with artificial intelligence, with these uh, humanoid robots, self-driving cars internet live streams woo <laughs> i don't know as scary as it is it's pretty wild and if you follow gurdjieff's ideas and work then i think you will be well prepared for any apocalypse that occurs but let's get back to the um the text for several months, they discussed and argued, and as a result, they this time split into parties. That is to say, all the learned beings then in the city of Babylon split into two independent, what are called sections, under the following names. The first, section of Neomothists. The second, section of Paleomothists. Each of these sections of learned beings soon had its adherents from among the ordinary beings in the city of Babylon. And once again, things would certainly have ended also with a civil war if the Persian king, hearing of it all, had not immediately cracked them on their learned noddles. <laughs> a number of these learned beings were executed by him, others were imprisoned with lice, and still others were dispatched to places where even now, as Mullah Nasser ad-Din would say, 
French champagne could not be taken. Only a few of those who were clearly shown to have been occupied with all this, only because, as it is said there, they were mad, were permitted to return to their own countries, and those among them who had taken no part whatever in political questions were not only also given full liberty to return to their native land, but by the order of the mentioned Persian king, their return to their native land was even accompanied with every kind of honour. Well then, my boy, those Babylonian learned beings who, owing to various reasons, survived and were scattered everywhere over the surface of almost the whole of the planet, continued by momentum their wise acreings, the basis of which they made, of course, not consciously, but simply mechanically, those two leading questions which had arisen and which had been the question of the day during the said Babylonian events, namely the famous question concerning the soul of men and the inner communal organization. <laughs> so yes, inner communal organization, a very interesting, um, a very interesting sort of term that, uh, yeah, and Kathy says, loneliness is a very serious modern day issue. People are so isolated that they are craving any type of connection, even if it whiz, is with a bot. Kathy goes on to say, I just want to say publicly that I ate too much this evening, but my tomato chorizo was too good. <laughs> oh, tomato shrimp orzo was so good. Well, um... <laughs> Kathy's, Kathy's come for a confession, and uh, it's okay, Kathy. We, we won't judge you here, uh, even if you do want to confess that you've eaten too much tomato shrimp orzo. Uh, <laughs> and I would say, just quickly on Kathy's loneliness comment, that one should go out into the world and join a club join a walking club that's the easiest thing to do everyone can walk everyone likes nature so if you're lonely find a local rambling club or walking club or any club that you like if you like chess a chess club if you like tennis a tennis club if you like golf a golf club etc etc and go to the club and say hello to someone hello you know maybe they're an arsehole and then say well i don't want to be your friend and then go and talk to someone else. Hopefully not everyone is an a-hole and you'll find some nice people with like-minded ideas. And there you go, you've made a friend. <laughs> um, hey, it's okay, Kathy. it's no problem at all. I enjoy the, uh, the banter, stroke, uh, chat, but I will get back to the story. And now we come on to this uh, Nalu Usnian spectrum of impulses. So a very interesting section now where there is a, um, a list of seven attributes for Hasnamus. And then he goes on to talk about the four different kinds of Hasnamus. So very interesting, especially the part, which I'll no doubt read and reread, where he talks about perfecting the higher being bodies. And if you don't do it, You'll have to reincarnate. Very interesting. And again, it says what it says, in my opinion. <laughs> I think you're right there, Kathy. Wise words. Assholes are people too. Besides, they keep things interesting. And, and that's another... Um, Kathy's saying that has reminded me. There's a man in Fritz Peter's book. You might remember, Graham. Rachmilovich or something, Rachmilovich, and he's one of these obnoxious, irritating, angry people, and Gurdjieff would, would pay, he paid him to stay at the, the Priory so that, you know, he keeps the friction going. Anytime he was there, you sort of couldn't be at ease because of how we, um, you know, how he sort of riled everyone up, and so, yeah. Our souls are people too, and they're important in the world. 
Anyway, we've got a few comments before we get back to the book. Uh, better to grow on your own than degrading among monkeys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that's how you feel, Voldemar. But maybe the monkeys will help you on your evolution. Laurie's enjoying the eclipse. So wonderful. Uh, Donna says... G mentions wise acring. Maybe when he mentions communal shenanigans, we would be wise to get some acres and build a community of other wise ones. Hey, you don't have to tell me, Donna, <laughs> but you have told me, so let's do it. <clears throat> the result of these wise acrings of theirs was that over the whole continent of Asia, civil wars again broke out in various communities, and the processes of mass reciprocal destruction between different communities. The destruction which thus proceeded of the, rem the remnants of the results of the conscious labours of the very saintly Asiata Shemash continued on the continent of Asia for about a century and a half. Yet, in spite of this, in some places there were preserved, and even by momentum were still carried out, certain forms that had been created by Asiata Shemash for their beneficent being existence. But when the three brain beings there who arose and existed on the neighbouring continent, now called Europe, then began taking, apart, taking part in the Asiatic wars, and when hordes with the arch vainglorious Greek called Alexander of Macedonia at their head were dispatched thence and passed almost everywhere over the continent of Asia, they made, as it is said, a clean sweep from the surface of that ill-fated planet of everything that had been established and had still been preserved and carried out, so clean a sweep that if that it left not even the trace of the memory that there could once have existed on the surface of their planet such a bliss, specially and intentionally created for their existence by such a reason whose possessor is now one of our seven most very saintly omnicosmic individuals, without whose participation even our uni-being common father does not allow himself to actualise anything. <laughs> Wonderful. Alexander of Macedonia made a clean sweep of Asia, and stamped out all of the very saintly conscious labours of Asiata Shemash, and there's nothing left. <laughs> he does, um, wise acrings, that's right. I think it just means, uh, I don't know, there's a... Uh, it, it's not one of his... It's a, it'll be interesting, Donna, just to get the... The definition of it, uh, why you're saying it, and I, f I think you're, uh, you're right. Um, uh, that's right, Kathy. According to Beelzebub, again, take it however you want, but um, uh, that's what Beelzebub's saying. Here we go. No results. To Wiseacre. Oh, no. Yeah, it's sort of pretending to be wise, it seems, Donna. Um, a person who possesses or affects to possess great wisdom. A person who wishes to seem wise, a wise person, often used facetiously or contemptuously. So, to wiseacre, wiseacring, is loads of people just hanging about, pretending to be smarter than they are. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I'm sure uh, people could fairly accuse me of wiseacring, but hey, roll with the punches, innit? <clears throat> 
And now, my boy, after my tale about this Lentro Hamsanin, thanks to which you obtain to a certain degree a conspective account of the consequences for subsequent generations ensuing from the activities of such a typical representative of eternal Hasnamus individuals from among the three brain beings of the planet Earth, it will now be quite opportune to explain to you, as I promised, a little more in detail about the significance of the word Hasnamus. In general, those independent individuals are called and defined by the word hasnamus, in whom, among what are called individual impulses, a certain something arises which participates in what is called the completed formation of independent individualities in the common presences of three brain beings, both of the highest possible coating, as well as of those who consist only of the planetary body alone. <coughs> This something in these separate cosmic individuals arises and blends in the process of the transformation of substances in them with the crystallizations resulting from the action of the entire spectrum of certain what are called Nalu Usnian impulses. This Nalu Usnian spectrum of impulses consists, on the basis of that chief cosmic law, the sacred Heptaparapashinok, according to the source of its essence in respect of the perception of engenderings and the resulting manifestations of seven heterogeneous aspects. If these separate aspects of the entire spectrum of Nalu Usnian impulses are described according to the notions of your favourites and, and expressed in their language, they might then be defined as follows. So here we go, the um, Nalu Usnian impulses of Ahasnamus. <laughs> Very interesting, and before I do... Uh okay, Karen, yes, enjoy... Uh Voldemar says, so much to learn, finally, but be careful not to know more than to be, to grow being with knowing, complete the challenge of this incarnation. I think you're right, uh, Voldemar, and Gurdjieff talks a lot about knowledge and being, and he's even said in this very chapter that Lentro Hasnamun, he had great knowledge, but no being. And so you have to develop them simultaneously in order to uh, make the best progress if one outweighs the other. Uh, Graham said it well before, you know. Um, you get a, a, I can't even remember, but let me try and remember as I'm talking about it. You get a weak yogi or a stupid saint, maybe. Or a, I think that's it. A stupid monk or a weak saint. Maybe uh, Graham can help me out. He's here. But, uh, yeah, knowledge and being is important. You have to um, progress along the lines at the same time. And Donna says, A person with an affectation of wisdom or knowledge regarded with scorn or irritation by others. A know-all. <laughs> a wiseacre. Yeah, well, I hope you're not talking about me, are you? <laughs> Only joking. And hello there, Consalo. And um, welcome. How to develop being? I would argue read In Search of the Miraculous. If you haven't yet, Voldemar, it's on the channel. You can go right now and start chapter one. That's what I would argue. So start there. So let's get into... Um... <coughs> oh, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. The... Um... <laughs> Anyway, I'll read this bit, the, the, uh, the, the introduction. This Nalu Usnian spectrum of impulses consists on the basis of that chief cosmic law, the sacred Heptaparapashinok, according to the source of its essence in respect of the perception of engenderings and the resulting manifestations of seven heterogeneous aspects. If these se separate aspects of the entire spectrum of Nalu Usnian impulses are described according to the notions of your favourites and expressed in their language, they might then be defined as follows. 1. Every kind of depravity, conscious as well as unconscious. 2. The feeling of self-satisfaction from leading others astray. 
3. The irresistible inclination to destroy the existence of other breathing creatures. 4. To urge to become free from the necessity of actualizing the being efforts demanded by nature. 5. The attempt by every kind of artificiality to conceal from others what in their opinion are one's physical defects. 6. The calm self-contentment in the use of what is not personally deserved. and 7. The striving to be not what one is. This certain something which arises in the presences of definite individuals owing to the enumerated nalu usnian impulses, besides being the cause of what are called serious retributive suffering consequences for these individuals themselves, also has the particularity that as soon as the action of what is called intense effort ceases in one of these individuals, the radiations proper to one or other of the aspects of the manifestations of this something have a greater effect on those around him and become a factor for engendering the same in them. In the common presence of every kind of three-brain being, there can arise during the process of his planetary existence four kinds of independent Hasnamus individuals. <coughs> yes, Donna, thank you. Um, <laughs> and... Kathy says, maybe you have allergies. Uh, I think it's more like a throat infection, maybe, or a chest infection. Um, but it is sort of manifesting in that way, like phlegm and coughs. But I feel fine. A bit much information, maybe, for you, but sorry about that. <laughs> and this section is where uh, Beelzebub's talking about, what does he say? The... Uh, uh, four kinds of independent Hasnamus individuals and how I interpret it, you must let me know if you agree, I'll uh, share it with you when I get to it yeah, about, you know if you don't it's in all the religions all of the religions talk about you know self-actualization self-perfection, self-realization uh, even in these text of Gurdjieff, Beelzebub and In Search of the Miraculous, objective reasoning I think it would be called but if you can get there in this life then you escape the wheel of samsara the Buddhists would say, the Buddhists would say that you, es you escape the wheel of samsara, you no need to keep coming back now into the wheel because you've broken free of it and I think that um <laughs> thanks mum <Mom. laughs> in the common presence of every kind of three brain being there can arise during the process of his planetary existence four kinds of independent Hasnamus individuals the first kind of Hasnamus individual is a three brain being who while acquiring in his common presence that something still consists only of his planetary body and who during the process of his sacred Raskuanu is subject to the corresponding consequences of the presence in him of the properties of this something and is thus destroyed for ever such as he is the second kind of Hasnamus individual is that Kejdrin body of a three-brain beings which is coated in his common presence with the participation of that same something and which, acquiring as is proper to such a cosmic arising, the property of Turinunino, that is, non-decomposition in any sphere of that planet on which he arose has to exist by being formed again and again in a certain way such as he is until this certain something will have been eliminated from him the third kind of Hasnamus individual is the highest being body or soul, during the coating of which, in the common presence of a three-brained being, this something arises and participates, and he also acquires the property of Turinorino, but this time proper to his highest being body. That is to say, this arising is no longer subject to decomposition, not only in the spheres of that planet on which he had his arising, but also in all other spheres of the great universe. The fourth kind of Hasnamus individual is similar to the third, but with this difference, that the Hasnamus of the third kind has the possibility of at some time succeeding in becoming, so to say, 
cleansed from this something, whereas this fourth kind, such a possibility is lost forever. That is why this fourth kind of Hasnamus is called an eternal Hasnamus individual. For these four kinds of Hasnamus individuals, owing to their having in their presences this something, the mentioned retributive suffering consequences of, are various and correspond both to the nature of each kind as well as to what is called objective responsibilities ensuing from the primordial providence and hopes and expectations of our common father concerning these cosmic actualizations. For the Hasnamus of the first kind, namely, when this something is acquired by a being still consisting only of just a planetary body alone, the decomposition of this planetary body of his does not proceed according to the general rule, that is to say, the cessation of the functioning in his organism of every kind of sensed impulse does not proceed simultaneously with the approach of the sacred Raskuanu, that is, death. But the process of the sacred Raskuanu begins in him still during his planetary existence and proceeds in parts, that is, one by one, they gradually cease to participate in his common presence, the functioning of one or other of his separate independent spiritualized localizations or, as your favorites would say there, in such a being, first of all, one of his brains with all its appertaining functions dies. Later on the second one dies, and only then does the final death of the being approach. In addition to this, after the final death, the disintegration of all the active elements of which the given planetary body was formed proceeds firstly much more slowly than usual, and secondly with the inextinguishable action only lessened in proportion to the volatili volatilization of the active elements of the mentioned sensed impulses he had during life. <coughs> For the second kind of Hasnamus individual, that is, when the Kesjun body of a three-brained being becomes such, the corresponding consequences are such that an indeed unfortunate arising, freed from the planetary body of a three-brained being, on the one hand not having the possibility of perfecting himself independently of and without a planetary coating, does not succeed in eliminating from his presence this maleficent something even not always acquired by his own fault, which something is always and with everything in the universe an obstacle for the correct flowing of the common cosmic trogo auto egocratic process. On the other hand, owing to the property in him of Turinurino, that is, not being subject to decomposition in any sphere of that solar system in which he is formed, he must inevitably be again coated in a planetary body, and in most cases with the exterior form of a being of one or two brain system, and in view of the brevity in general of the duration of beings of these planetary forms, and also not having time to adapt himself to a single exterior form, he must constantly begin all over again in the form of another being of the planet with a full uncertainty as to the result of this coating. <clears throat> Yes, thanks for caring, guys. Uh, I hope that it goes away on its own. <laughs> but... <laughs> and that bit there. I'll read it again. Um... On the other hand, owing to the property in him of Turin Audio, that is, not being subject to decomposition in any sphere of that solar system in which he is formed, he must inevitably be again coated in a planetary body. And he's saying here, in most cases with the exterior form of a one or two brain system. So, <coughs> there's a chance that, again, you'll become a, a sheep or a dog or a cat. You know, you'll reincarnate as that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and he says, be be again coated in a planetary body. You could say, reincarnate. <coughs> 
And as regards the third kind of Hasnamus individual, namely when the highest being body of a three-brain being becomes such, and when this certain something participates in his coating in such a quality that he never loses the possibility of freeing himself from it, the matter is still more terrible chiefly because he, as a higher cosmic arising, who, according to the foreseeing first-sourced principle of everything existing, was predetermined to serve the aim of helping the government of the whole increasing world, and on whom, from the moment of the completion of his formation, even when he was not yet perfected in reason, was placed the the responsibility for every subjective, voluntary as well as involuntary manifestation has the possibility to succeed in eliminating from his presence this something exclusively only by the action of the results of intentionally actualized park dog duty, that is to say, of conscious labours and intentional suffering. Hence, such a higher being body must inevitably always suffer correspondingly, having already acquired the gradation of what is called the degree of cognition of one's own individuality until this certain something is entirely eradicated from his common presence. As a place for the suffering existence of such a high order of Hasnamus individuals, the higher sacred individuals have intentionally allotted, from the totality of the large cosmic concentrations, four planets, disharmonized in their subjective functioning, situated in various most remote corners of our great universe. One of these four disharmonized planets, called Eternal Retribution, is specially prepared for the Eternal Hasnamus individuals and the other three for those higher being bodies of Hasnamuses in whose common presences there is still the possibility of, at some time or other, eliminating from themselves the mentioned Maleficent something. The three small planets existing under the names of Remorse of Conscience, Two, Repentance, and three, self-reproach. Here it is interesting to notice that from among all the highest being bodies which have been coated and perfected in every kind of exterior form of three-brain being there have, so far, reached the planet Retribution from the whole universe, only 313, two of whom had their arising on your planet, and one of these is the highest being body of this Lentro Hasna Hamsanin, on that planet retribution, these eternal Hasnamus individuals must constantly endure those incredible sufferings called Inkiranudel, which are like the sufferings called remorse of conscience, but only much more painful. The chief torture of the state of these highest being bodies is that they must always experience these terrifying sufferings, fully conscious of the utter hopelessness of their sensation. <laughs> The end of book one. I don't know if you can see that. We now begin the second book. So on Wednesday, on Wednesday we will begin the second book. And chapter 29 is The Fruits of Former Civilizations and the Blossoms of the Contemporary. A very fascinating chapter. And then the chapter after that, which we'll likely read next week, is Art. And art is a very long chapter, and of course, is talking about art. So, <clears throat> it is right, book one of three, Kathy. So, a wonderful end, and, uh, excuse me. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, honey's good. I, I'll often, if I feel really bad, I'll, I'll have a honey and lemon tea. So rather than putting milk in your tea, you put uh, honey and lemon, which is very lovely. So that's the end of book one. On Wednesday, we will begin book two, of course, and uh, the chapter that I've just mentioned. And tomorrow, I think I'm going to share... Rather than do a reading, I won't have uh, so much time. I'm, I'm busy, but I'll do. I want to share with you a chapter from Fritz Peter's Boyhood with Gurdjieff, um, relating to Miss Madison. 
and how Gurdjieff gives this said Miss Madison a very strong shock, a very strong and powerful shock and impression. And he explains to Fritz Peters after, who's only a small boy and of course can't understand what Gurdjieff's done. And Gurdjieff explains to him that she might not understand now, but later she will and everything's changed. So um, it's a wonderful little story and really gives an insight into Gurdjieff the man. And so that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow, all being well. Um, Voldemar says, so the only way to progress is here before losing the body. And Graham answers you, Voldemar says, uh, time is of the essence. And of course, the religious teachings and the religions of the world argue that this is the um this is why we come to learn to have experiences to burn karma to evolve and if one's lucky enough and makes the requisite efforts to escape the wheel of samsara like i said and in gurdjieff words so that you don't have to come back and be coated in a planetary body again so Yes, of course, you can't do it once you're dead, obviously, Voldemar. So one must make efforts now. And as we read, um, yeah, time is time is precious. Time's running out, like we read in one of the previous chapters, the disease of tomorrow. We suffer from the disease of tomorrow. And we think that we'll have tomorrow forever. There's a day when we won't have tomorrow. So uh, Donna says, in every heart there is art. And I think you're right, Donna. And it's up to the individual to find the way to express that, right? Some people is gardening. Some people is painting. Some people is reading aloud on the internet. You have to find your way of expression. And that's a, a noble endeavor and goal in life. Uh, Gonzalo says, love your reads. I'm happy to hear that. Um, Kathy says, many times I've wondered what studying under G would have been like if I lived during that era. And it's a very interesting um, thing to contemplate, isn't it? But Kathy, make sure you listen tomorrow to uh, this thing about Miss Madison. I think I'm going to call the video Gurdjieff, um, the master conductor because that's how I see it. When I read that chapter, I see that he's like a conductor in the orchestra. He can give anyone a shock at any time. And obviously, if he builds up to something and plans it out, he can give them a really strong shock, which is what he does to poor Miss Madison. And yeah, again, you'll see tomorrow. Um, uh, Gonzalo says, when's the next poll? <coughs> and sadly, Gonzalo, because we're reading so many in-depth books, yeah, I have to apologise, there won't be a poll for a while unless everyone's desperate for a change of tune, because we've got Beelzebub's Tales, we've got Oliver Twist, which is a long, a long book as well, and we've got uh, Walden, which is nearly finished, but maybe I will put a poll, I know you want uh, the second... Uh, wishing chair and maybe some other people would like some more light-hearted storybooks so maybe I will do a poll soon Gonzalo uh, to give people a little break from Dickens and Gurdjieff <laughs> rather heavy going uh, but no thank you um Kathy, uh, Leonardo says, good reading. I'm glad you enjoyed it, my friend. Be sure to come back on Wednesday for the next chapter. Kathy said, maybe it's more like you can't move on because you are not crystallized enough. So you repeat the same because that is all you can do. Or your vibrations won't allow you to move off the wheel of samsara. Um, yeah, I mean... I suppose it's however you want to interpret it, isn't it? One, If you're a Buddhist, you'll interpret it one way. If you're a Hindu, you interpret it the other way. 
and the Abrahamic faith, the Christian, Muslim and Jew will interpret it another way. Um, but yes, if you haven't, Gurdjieff argues, I think the Kejjan body is the soul, or and if you haven't developed it, then it's not there, and when you die, there's no second body. In um, Theosophical, uh, Madame Blavatsky and also in Yogananda's teachings, Kriya Yog, he talks about, uh, you've got, and, and even in theurgy and, and hermeticism, you've got the planetary body, the bo physical body, the astral body, the mental body, and the causal body. And I'm not going to go into digression about all this, but if you've created an astral and a mental body, then when you pass on, those bodies will carry on existing after the death of the planetary body. So, um, yeah, again, who knows? But there's a wonderful chapter at the end of Autobiography of a Yogi, Yogananda's, Paramhansa Yogananda's autobiography, where he talks about Hiranyaloka, this astral heaven. <laughs> and his guru, Sri Yukteswar, has been there and he comes back. He's resurrected. The chapter's called The Resurrection of Sri Yukteswar. And if you're a Christian, it's very funny when I talk to uh, people who, who they say, oh, only Jesus can be resurrected. And I say, but surely if Jesus was resurrected, that means resurrection is possible because you believe it. You believe we've just had Easter, haven't we? So that's what Easter is, the resurrection of Christ. Christ is risen. So he is possible because you believe it. And they say, yeah, but, but only for Jesus, though. <laughs> and I say, well, then you should read the autobiography of a yogi, because according to Yogananda, uh, Sri Yukteswar resurrected physically in his hotel room in Mumbai and gave him a long discourse on the astral realm. And so, <laughs> fascinating stuff. Um, uh, yes, Voldemar, I'm going to say farewell now, so we, we don't really have time... For the super efforts, uh, Voldemar wants to know how everyone does their super efforts, but I think it's up to you as an individual. Um, you, you must, uh, yeah, Graham's just sort of helped and answered. It says, the problem is, can we push ourselves to make super efforts or do we need an outside force to push us, which is where a teacher, a guru does come in handy because you would submit your will to the teacher and he would tell you, or she, do this and don't stop until you've done it. And that's the easiest way to have a teacher, a guru, who you, um, uh, yeah, who you submit to. But again, as we've said, comes with all sorts of other troubles. Um, hey, you're welcome, Nick Cooper. Bill says ciao for now and adios amigo. Uh, and Leonardo says... Uh, thinks in now and not future and past. It looks like a self-remembering. Um, yeah, I think so. Kathy says, they say we all have a spark, maybe like a seed. The potential is there, but to ha do you have to nurture it to grow, just like a seed to a tree? That's how I interpret it. Um, yes, and Gurdjieff says, there's no um, no mechanical evolution in a spiritual sense, you can't evolve mechanically. It requires conscious efforts. So any evolution that you're doing, any crystallization of your being and of the Kejjan body, the soul, the growth of these higher being bodies, they will only come about through our individual efforts. Um, and so without our individual efforts, we're not going to evolve. And that's a great point. Uh, Nick Cooper, I'll be using that. I'll put that in my uh, my arsenal for ammunition. N uh, Nick makes a great point. Don't forget Lazarus was said to have been resurrected after four days by Jesus. So that's um, arsenal for my argument. And thanks for reminding me, Nick. I remember now you said it. And so it's possible. 
<laughs> so um I'm glad you enjoyed it, Kathy. Uh yeah, I was I was getting rather passionate for a while there and yeah, I suppose it's better than boring monotone uh, just reading. But I'm really enjoying our progress through the tales. It's great to have you all here um together, you know, working through it together. It's a wonderful project that we're all undertaking. And I hope we're all getting out of it what we need. So um, you're welcome, Voldemar. Uh, everyone, it's my pleasure to share this with you. And we'll be back on Wednesday night for... Um, we'll be back on Wednesday. And uh, hey, uh, Stephen says, before I go, amazing and thank you. I last heard this chapter at Bray. In 1985, being read by Chris Thompson. And uh, Stephen, I've been to Bray myself many times uh, for weekends, a couple of weekends and many uh, work days. And I think Bray was a wonderful facility. I don't know if it's still operational. Do you know, Stephen, is it still operational? Has it been shut down? Uh, Henriette Lands, I believe, Madame Lands, um, established it. And I have a book by her upstairs. Laurie, enjoy the eclipse. And I hope there's no um, planetary disturbances, whether here or in the moon. Uh, but yeah, amazing, Stephen. I've been to Bray, like I said. I think it's fantastic. Um, and so that's all for today. Tomorrow I'll be back talking about Gurdjieff, the great conductor. And Wednesday we'll read chapter 29. And I don't know what I'm going to do on Thursday or Friday. If you'd like to hear me uh, rabbit on about anything else within the Gurdjieff ideas and frameworks, you must reach out, let me know, and we'll work through those ideas together. So guys, look after yourselves, take care, and I'll see you tomorrow to discuss Miss Madison and Gurdjieff's shock. So guys, take care, look after yourselves, and I'll see you later. And Donna aptly says goodnight slugs with a little kiss there. So <laughs> good night, three brain beings, favorites of Hussein on the planet Earth. Take care, guys. Good night. Sleep well. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. <laughs>